Welcome to State Lobbying Heroes Podcast, a podcast where we delve into the careers and personal life stories of some of the best and the brightest state government relations experts. I'm your host, Deepak, CEO of Registracker. Zach Johnson grew up in South Dakota before he moved to Georgia when he was 14 years old. He loved playing baseball while also working different kinds of jobs in high school. He started out with a business degree in Georgia Military College and he loved the structure and discipline the college had to offer. Right after that, he went on to get his political science degree from Georgia College State University. During his junior year, he also ran for city council of the district at the age of 23. He lost that campaign, but it was the best thing that happened to Zach. Why? Zach explains the reasons, his experiences in this next episode. Hey, Zach, thank you so much for attending this podcast. I really do appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm, I'm honored to be asked. Thank you so much for inviting me. So let's get started. Can you give us a brief background? Where did you grow up and how was your childhood like? Yeah, so I, I grew up probably one of the few people you ever meet that grew up in South Dakota. I grew up in South Dakota right outside Sioux Falls, a little town called Vermilion. My dad worked at the University of South Dakota, and it was a great place to grow up, a town of about 9,000 farmers, salt-of-the-earth folks. And then I moved to Macon, Georgia when I was 14, which a uh, Midwestern boy to move to Macon was a pretty big change. But uh, Macon was a good place to grow up. I went to public school there, went to Central High School and played baseball, still love, love the game of baseball, play with my sons all the time. My folks, until my dad passed away in 2012, still live in Macon. My mom still lives there. Um, two older sisters, both of whom are married with kids. One lives in Chicago and one lives in uh, Milledge. So now I'm happy to be a resident of uh, Georgia. I live in, uh, in Brookhaven, right outside, uh, right outside Atlanta. Very nice. And your childhood or high school, were you interested in politics? In hindsight, I was. One of my earliest memories was riding in, my, in the car with my dad. And I guess it would have been 1988 and listening to, used to listen to NPR all the time, which I actually do now. And them talking about the 88 election with George H.W. Bush and, and Michael Dukakis. And my dad was a Republican. I remember him talking about how much he hoped that H.W. Bush would win. And of course, not knowing what he was talking about, but always kind of having an interest in it, probably because he liked, but never did I think that I would work in politics. If you would ask me that when I was you know, in high school. No, I didn't. Oh, okay. So you never participated in any debates or any political groups or anything like that there? In, in high school, no. In college, I was very active. But in high school, I just played sports and uh, tried, to stay, tried to stay out of trouble. I've had a job since I was 12. So I started working when I was 12 years old in a batting cage. And so then I worked at Kroger for four years in high school. I had three jobs when I was in college. I worked as a caddy, worked at Kroger, and then also at a golf course, a different golf course. And so I, I just have always had a chance to, to work when I wasn't in, in school. So no, I didn't do anything extracurricular when it comes to when it comes to that. Okay, so let's move on. So about your school, about sure. your college. Um, so you got a political science degree, am I right? Yeah, well, I got two degrees. I started out at Georgia Military College and I got a business degree there. And Georgia Military College was great for me. After high school, I probably wasn't the most ready to be out of my own, probably the most, wasn't the most mature kid. And so going to a school with the structure I um, mean, the discipline like Georgia Military College was exactly what I needed. And so went there, got my core out of the way, got a business degree, and then went. And actually, that was actually in Milledgeville, Georgia also. I just went across town to GCSU in Milledgeville and got my, my political science degree. Um, and then when I was also in college, when I was a junior in college, I ran for the city council of the district. I lived downtown in the district downtown. The city council was a guy named Ken Vance. And Ken is a nice man, um, got to know him after the election, but he was a city councilman and also the chief of police. And so no one had run against him in 20 years. And so I decided, well, shoot, I'll run. And so I ran, ran a good campaign. At the time, he'd been on council 24 years. I was only 23 years old. So he'd been on council before I was born wow. and only by eight votes. I got 145 votes. He got 153. We had a televised debate. I had yard signs. I mean, I ran a real campaign. Nice. When I did that, I got beat. But you know, in hindsight, Getting beat was probably the best thing for me because it gave me a chance to get exposure, to get the experience, but I wasn't kind of stuck in, in Milledgeville. I wouldn't have been able to leave and go on and work at the Capitol and all the other th things I was able to do. So running and losing was probably, in hindsight, the best thing 
is as tough as it was at the time. That's awesome. So what made you, so you started with a business administration degree. Yes. What made you switch to political science? I don't actually, I guess in hindsight, I, I, I really got involved with the George Bush campaign in 2004. I was involved with college Republicans, even though I'm a Republican, but I'm not a hardcore right winger, but I am a Republican. And I uh, got involved in that. Just really kind of took a liking to politics. I think that I always kind of enjoyed maybe the admiration, the attention I got playing sports in high school. And then when I went to college, I don't get that anymore. You kind of want to get your face out there and be involved. And so maybe it was, I don't know, maybe it was arrogance or maybe it was just wanting attention. But for whatever reason, I really always liked politics. I liked having my voice heard, liked having my opinion heard. I enjoyed debating, debating ideas in a respectful manner. So it's just something that I really enjoy. I'm happy that I did. I'm, I've stuck to it and it's a good career and it's something that I find very fulfilling. So let's move on. So after your degree at the Georgia College State University, yes. what was your first position? I know you were at a government affairs consultant, right? Yeah. So right out of there, I, I graduated college in 2000, spring of 06, and uh, I was dating someone who lived in Macon. So I moved back home and at the time, now outgoing mayor of Macon, Robert Rickert, was running for his first election. And so I went down there and me and another guy I went to high school with ran his campaign. And Mayor Rickert won, thankfully, has done an amazing job. That was I've always been involved in volunteering on campaigns, but nothing to the level of that. Helped run his campaign. He won. And then from that, moved to Montgomery, Alabama and got my first lobbying job for the American Cancer Society. They brought me on to try to pass a, a smoke-free Alabama initiative, which you know, back in 2007 wasn't very popular in Alabama, and so that initiative failed. Um, I was, took that job at eight months. Didn't really, I didn't like Montgomery, nothing wrong with it. It wasn't for me, didn't know anybody, but still dating the same person. So I moved back to Macon and got involved with Mike Huckabee's campaign. And then from that little six-week six volunteering uh, spat on, on Mike Huckabee's campaign, met a guy who knew a state senator from Macon, who was the majority whip at the time, Cecil Staten, and he said, hey, Cecil needs a year-round legislative aid, driver, all the above. Would you want the job? I said, yeah. So I went and interviewed with Senator Staten and got the job there. And I worked as his full-time aide for almost four years. And that was, that was a blessing because it allowed me to see how the political game worked, how, legis how the legislative process worked, the committee process, everything. I mean, it was essentially like a paid internship. He paid me at a job, benefits and all that. But I got to learn intricate details of how the process worked. And that was just an invaluable. Plus, he was he was a wonderful man to work for. He was a preacher by trade, just a really good human being. So what would you suggest? Let's say if someone was listening to this and they were getting their political science degree. So mm -hmm. what would be, do you think, would be the first step they should take to get their feet wet and to get into lobbying or government affairs? If they want to be a lobbyist? Well, political science is great. You're going to read Locke. You're going to read Hobbes. You're going to read Bacamelli. You're going to read Plato. But that's not going to necessarily teach you anything about, I mean, maybe Machiavelli will. But to, to all intents and purposes, college teaches you how to study, how to be independent, how to be self-sufficient. But there's nothing outside maybe the, the format of government that you learn in government in high school that really helped me in my lobbying world that I learned with my political science degree. Now, it made me realize that I like politics, you understand political theory, but by and large, lobbying is sales. What you're doing is you're, you're selling yourself, you're selling your understanding, you're selling your access, you're selling your information, and you're, you're, you're just being persuasive in the sense that you're taking the need of a client and you are relaying that need to decision makers in, in the legislative body. And so while political science was a great, was a great uh, degree to get, just have confidence in yourself. Try to meet as many people as you can. Network as much as you can. 25% of lobbying is knowing the structure of government, understanding how it all works. That's very, very important. But you also got to go out there and hustle and sell and sell yourself. It's a confidence game. It really is. You have to have confidence in yourself and convey that confidence to the client that you can get the job done. But on the back end, you also have to be able to get the job done. Because if you just sell them a bill of goods, you'll, you won't last very long. So it, it takes both. It takes the selling side, and it also takes the, the being able to, to, where the rubber meets the road at the end, being able to actually get the job done under the gold dome or whatever body you work in. Sure. So let's say your three or four year stint, the first position you had as a government affairs consultant. Yes. Can you tell us like what one skill you gained from that position? which you probably are applying it even now. The most valuable thing I've ever, ever done was after I left Senator Staten's office, I went and I lobbied independently for the State Bar of Georgia, which was wonderful. I built them a grassroots program, got lawyers involved all over the state. I loved that. That gave me my first 
really foray into lobbying at the, at, at the Capitol. But that was a contract job. And I also did work for the um, ophthalmologist where I would bring in legislators to watch cataract surgery, things like that. But I got a call one day, this is probably, I don't know, 2013, 2014, from two guys in the governor's office at the time, it was then Governor Deal. And they knew I was working at the state bar, but they said, listen, the Department of Administrative Services, DOAS in Georgia, is looking for a government affairs guy. Would you want a job? I'll be honest with you, I'd heard of DOAS, but I didn't really know what it was that they had done. It was a no-name alphabet agency. And so I called a mentor of mine and I mentioned it to him. He said, take it. I don't care what they pay you, just take it. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, DOAS, amongst other things, does state procurement. And what that means is the state of Georgia buys billions of dollars worth of stuff a year, everything you can think of. And it all runs one way or another through DOAS. And so what I did was I went in there and I learned the nitty gritty details of procurement in the state of Georgia. And as someone that no one, particularly in the lobbying side, really understands how to navigate that, that bureaucratic process of state procurement. And actually, I'm the only lobbyist in the state of Georgia, the only single one who's a certified procurement associate. There's something called a GCPA, which every agency has their own in-house contracting procurement person. And all those people have to get basically a degree the DOAS puts on these classes that take anywhere from two to six months. You have to get a degree to be a certified procurement associate. Even though I was a lobbyist, when I was at DOAS, I went in and I got my GCPA. And so having that procurement background, that skill set, is really invaluable because it allows me to take businesses that have a really good product or really good service that would benefit the state of Georgia and walk them through that process that by and large, they may know technology, they may know whatever their services, they don't know government procurement, well I do. So that, that more than anything has really improved my value I think, and it's something that I really enjoy because I get to help businesses and I get to help the state of Georgia buy the best product for them and ultimately for the taxpayer. So learning procurement was the best thing I've ever done professionally. Oh, awesome. So this, you learned this when you were at State Bar of Georgia, is that right? No, when I was at the Department of Administrative Services, I left the state right. ball and then I went to, to DOAS. Now DOAS is human resource, they do surplus property, they do risk, but the main thing they do is they are the mothership for all state procurement in the state. So every agency has their own procurement shop right. and they're called the DPA, which is a delegated purchase authority and it's a limit under which they agencies can buy what they want. If their dollar amount, usually $500,000, is above that dollar amount, then DOAS has to come in and buy that or procure that thing for them. And so DOIS is basically the end-all be-all mothership for everything the state of Georgia buys, which is a huge intersection between government and business. I mean, that is where they meet. So that was a wonderful place for me to sit and learn. And that's what I did for close to four years. Oh, that's awesome. So that basically means you have the unique skill set of not only the lobbying world, the government, how the government works, but also the procurement side. Absolutely. A lot of lobbyists, and there's nothing wrong with it, it's a very valuable skill set to have, but a lot of lobbyists are one trick ponies in the sense that what they do is they lobby under the gold dome. They'll work from January to May and they'll work on legislation. They'll work on passing legislation, amending legislation, killing legislation in some aspects. But I always wondered, okay, well, when session's not in April to December, what are you going to do to show value for your clients? So what I'm able to do, thankfully, is not, not only do stuff under the gold dome in terms of passing legislation, which I can do very easily, but I can also work in these health agencies, work in the GTA, work with DOAS, work with all these agencies that the money is appropriated to during session to then help them buy and spend that money in, in an equitable way for, for the state and also for my clients. And so being able to work not just in the General Assembly, but also in the various agencies around the state and local governments as well, has been extremely valuable for the longevity that I've, I've, I've seen and, and hope to continue to see in, in government affairs. That's awesome. So after that, 2017, you were the VP of Government Relations at MWC, McGuire Wood. Yes, McGuire Wood. So McGuire Wood kind of recruited me out of DOAS. And it was funny, I used to get, when I was at DOAS, lobbyists would call me all the time and I, uh, I would kind of, because nobody understands the procurement process. And so fellow lobbyists would call me and say, hey, help me understand this. Could you get my clients set up with this? And I'd always try to help them. So one of the guys that I would help all the time, a good friend of mine, a guy by the name of Michael, reached out to me and said, hey, would you consider coming to work at our firm? And so I was kind of recruited out of, out of the state by McGuire Woods and went and worked there for two years. And it was a it was a good experience. It was a good shop, really enjoyed it, had some really good clients there. And then after two years there, I was recruited to go work at Barnes and Thornburg, which is just a top-notch law firm that I work at right now. We have offices all over the US, housed and we're based in uh, 
Indianapolis, and it's just a top-notch corporate law firm that really allowed me to spread my wings, and, and it's just a wonderful place to work. And I was there for, it was a year in July, actually July 1st. Uh, okay, so let's talk more about your current position at sure, yeah. Vines and Thornburg. So tell us what kind of work do you do here? Is it primary lobbying or is it a mix of both procurement and lobbying? What is it that, what are kind of- yeah, So it's a mix of both. I have, I have a lot of procurement clients I do work for that I brought over from McGuire Woods and also you know, a lot that I've gained while at uh, Barnes and Thornburg. And then in addition to that, we have a lot of legislative clients. We represent the Studio Alliance. We represent the movie studios in Georgia. We do a lot of work with Netflix, do a lot of work with NBC Universal. We're very, very heavily entrenched in the movie industry here in Georgia. I guess you could say for good or for bad, the government touches pretty much everything that everybody does. And so oftentimes businesses need guys like us to, to go in and help them with it because they know their business. They don't know the government. And so being able to have that dual capacity of procurement and legislative stuff has been a real value add. And uh, thankfully, Barnes and Thornburg provides me a, a repository of existing business um, from other offices as well as here and an opportunity to go out and bring in new business. And so we have a, a growing and robust government affairs shop here. And uh, there's five of us on our team here in Atlanta. And uh, we have government affairs shops in Ohio, Indiana. We have a big presence in DC. So it's really a wonderful government affairs environment to work in. So can you tell us maybe one project which was which you worked on, which had a significant impact? Sure, absolutely. So I have a client company by the name of TELUS. And there's something that was passed when, when Trump passed his tax cuts federally. There was a little piece of legislation in that massive tax cut called the 21st Century Cures Act. Now, what that did is that mandates that every state has to implement something called EVV or electronic visit verification. And now what this does is it's basically a Medicaid mandated initiative that fights fraud, waste, and abuse. So oftentimes what happens is let's just say that my mom or your mom is sitting at home and they're they can't leave the house. So a home health worker comes to them and tries to take care of it. What was happening was home health care workers were going there, not cleaning them, not bathing them, not feeding them, saying they were doing it, leaving, and defrauding the federal government to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars a year. So the federal government cracked down on this and said, listen, if you're going to take this Medicaid money, you got to figure out a way, individual states, to ensure that this home health care is actually getting done. And so my client tell us, and there's a brilliant man, the CEO, a guy named by the name of Brad Levine, came up with this wonderful cell phone-based technology that allows for the federal government to basically go in and audit where the home health care worker is, what was done when they were there, and it helps to basically ensure that that fraud, waste, and abuse is not taking, taking place. And I, I worked with Brad for God, about a, a year and a half, and tell us, tell us partnering with a company called Conduit won the state contract in the state of Georgia. And so because of the work that Brad and I did in the state of Georgia and, and the federal government's going to save millions and millions and millions of dollars on fraud, waste, and abuse, not to mention the fact that indigent people, people that need home health care, are actually now going to get the care that they needed. And so that's something that I'm extremely, extremely proud of. That's cool that you guys work on such important legislation, which really impact down to every constituent, you know, every every common man. So that's- Yeah, you know, it does. Yeah. It does. You know, a lot of times lobbyists get a bad, and I think people watch House of Cards, people watch Thank You for Smoking, and they think lobbyists are, are, what we do is bad. But I mean, Goodwill has a lobbyist. The Boy Scouts have a lobbyist. Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, recycling centers, great organizations have lobbyists too. The, the purpose that we serve, ideally, is legislators come from all walks of life, and they're not experts on all the things that they have to vote on. And if they were going to be experts in all the stuff they'd have to vote on, they wouldn't have any time to do anything else. So what we do is we become experts in the field that our clients want us to be. And then we help relay that information in a finite period of time to elected officials so they can make the best and most informed decision. That's what our role is. So if you're able to do that and if you're able to, to, to be a good steward of your client and their information, you can make a lot, of, a lot of difference and really do some good stuff. You really can. So let me ask you some general questions now. Sure. How do you stay current? with the current state of affairs and politics? Do you have any tools or anything like that? Oh, goodness. That assumes I want to stay current with the current state of affairs. <laughs> Sometimes I just want to turn everything off. Yeah, I, I don't really do social media. I'm 38 years old, but I just am not. I think it's sometimes it's just a kind of a cesspool. I read the Wall Street Journal every day. I swear by the Wall Street Journal. 
I am kind of an old man. I take the train to and from work and I'm on the Capitol. And so I read the, I get the hard paper copy in my driveway every morning. I love having my cup of coffee and reading the paper front to front, front to back. And that's how I stay current. I mean, I watch the news as best I can and, and try to, what you'll find is both extremes, the Tea Party guys and the Bernie Sanders guys, both extremes of both parties are generally wrong. The truth is right in the middle. The truth is in that gray area. And so what I try to do is just take things with a grain of salt, and realize that the extremes on both sides are generally not where you want to be. And your best bet is just being in the middle and being open-minded. And there's a reason why you have two ears and one mouth, right? Because you're supposed to listen more than you talk. And I try to do that. And I try to be as open-minded and pragmatic as I can be with information. Being a lobbyist, you, you find yourself important closed door meetings. You find yourself being privy to information and access that maybe the general public, public doesn't. And so you'll be in conversations with people around a fire pit or over dinner and they'll think what they heard on TV is what truth is. The fact of the matter is you were in the meeting with the legislator that passed the thing or you helped write the bill. And so oftentimes what you hear on TV isn't the whole truth. And so it's very important in my opinion to, to have an open mind and take things with a grain of salt. And that's what I try to do. Yeah. So just a bit to expand on that, how would you change that perspective? Let's say if you were given the mic right now, and let's say the general public has an opinion on lobbyists or politics, right? How would you change that perspective? Well, the, the general public does have an opinion. And I think that oftentimes it's, it's just like I said, I think that don't believe everything you hear on both sides, because oftentimes truth, unfortunately, nowadays has become relative. There are, don't seem to be any facts anymore when I just think people need to be open-minded and realize the fact that just because someone disagrees with you doesn't mean they're a bad person. That's one of the good things I like about lobbying is you can have a client on one side of the issue and I can have a client on the other side of the issue and we can battle at the Capitol all day and afterwards go get dinner and a beer and still be best of friends. It doesn't need to be personal. At the end of the day, I'll just people trying to get through their lives and, and, and take care of our kids. And so if you can realize the fact that even if someone disagrees with you, if their heart's in the right place, you're not a bad person just because they vote one way or another. And that's what I would say. That's okay. Grab, just we're all good people, but it yeah. never means well. Yeah, I agree. So, how do you see the future of Georgia politics shaping up? Well, it's it's going to be an interesting year. I mean, the margin of of in terms of the general assembly here in Georgia, we have a, a bigger majority in the Senate than we do the House. I think the margin in the, the House is fifteen votes, but you could see a razor thin margin in the House of Representatives, which is going to mean there's got to be a lot more horse trading to happen. Votes are going to have to be that much harder to work because you're not going to have these super majorities where you can pass anything you want, which, you know, one could argue is kind of a good thing. You want to have a, I guess, depends on the side you're, you're on, but you're going to have a, a close election there. I think that a lot of the suburban Atlanta areas are swimming. Gwinnett County, for instance, has already essentially gone Democrat. Cobb County went for Hillary Clinton instead of Trump, I think. I think it also went for Stacey Abrams instead of Governor Kemp. And so the demographics in Atlanta and, and state of Georgia are changing. So I think it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Now, they're saying, of course, that Vice President Biden is, is leading Georgia. I'd be not shocked, but I'd be surprised if he won Georgia. But crazy things have happened. I think the last Democrat to win Georgia may have been Clinton in 96, I think. Don't quote me on that. But it's changing, it's varying, it's different, but ebbs and flows. When I first moved here in 94, Zell Miller was governor and everybody was Democrats. And now they're all Republicans and then they'll all switch back. So it ebbs and flows and it, it, it changes. But I'll tell you, by and large, when you get down to it, a lot of cases, and there's not much difference between Republicans and Democrats at the, at the political level. It's just a matter of who's being in charge of the money. So, I mean, they, they want to be Republicans and want to be Democrats on some issues, but Oftentimes, they just kind of want to be in charge of whoever's in charge. So the, the conviction isn't there for, for a lot of them. Some of them they are. Some are true believers, but oftentimes a lot of them aren't. So I think you got to take with a grain of salt. So see, looking at yourself in the future, yes. mm -hmm. where do you see yourself? I mean, do you envision yourself to be something in a couple of years down the road or five years down the road? Are you planning to run for office or anything like that? I always wanted to be a politician. I, I thought I'd always want to be a politician, but now I'm not so sure that I want to. I kind of like my privacy. And as I've gotten older, I don't, I really dislike being the center of attention. I don't, <laughs> I'd much be happier sitting by myself in the, by a lake somewhere fishing or something. I, I just don't know if that's something I want to do. I, I know I want to stay in government affairs because so much of what you do in, in government affairs is relation and it's experience. And so the more tenured and more seasoned that I get, the more effective and more successful I'll be. So I'd love to have a good run at my firm and, and to continue being successful and growing a large book of business and helping business and, and upping my profile and becoming that much bigger of a player under the gold dome and um, just having a long storied career. There are guys at the Capitol now that are 
the stages of this business. They've been doing it for 30, 40 years. And every respect them, they can get a lot done. They can be very effective. And so that's what I'd like. I'd like to keep working hard and building a reputation and uh, be very successful in this field is what I'd like to do. Excellent. So those are the set of questions I had for you. So I'll give you a few minutes just to talk anything about yourself, which you think I missed, or if you want to project anything about yourself or your organization. So the platform is all yours. No, I want to thank you for the opportunity. This is a wonderful, a wonderful thing. And you know, like I say, I think that the skill set that I have and that Barnes & Thornburg has could be a great value add to a lot of clients out there, particularly clients that want to do business with the state of Georgia. So I'd, I'd welcome the opportunity to, uh, to help them in any way that I can. And I thank you for the platform to do so. Oh, sure thing. So now um, we have the rapid fire session. Good. All right. I have five questions for you. You can either answer them in one sentence or one word. It's up to you. So let's start off. What are the three skills you think are essential for someone to become a good lobbyist? Listening, learning, and being persuasive. Awesome. What would you be if you weren't a lobbyist? You know, it sounds crazy to say, but I really, really enjoy like yard work. I'm really good with my hands. So probably like landscape design. I, I do a lot of stuff outside. I really enjoy being outside and working outside. So probably some type of landscaper, designer in people's backyards. Sounds good. What is your favorite book? There's a really good book that I read about. It's called Marathon. It's about the 1976 presidential election. If you look at all the people that ran for that, you had Carter, you had Birch Bayh on the Republican side. You know, of course, you had Ford, you had um, George Wallace. So it's really, really dense, but it's a wonderful book. People don't realize that Jimmy Carter essentially moved to Iowa and lived there for a year. And that, of course, propelled him on. But uh, it's called Marathon. Okay. The 76 presidential election. Do you have any role models in your life? My father was, my father's passed away, but he was a, my dad was a great guy. He came from nothing. He was the oldest of five kids. First one in the history of my family, all the way back to Europe to graduate high school. First one to go to college. I mean, pulled himself up from absolutely nothing to, to graduate college, to, to be a successful person, to have a son sitting here with a great job at a law firm. So yeah, my dad was just an amazing guy. He died of cancer in 2012, but he was my dad was awesome and I miss him all the time. It'd be useful to have him now with, with my sons. I could use some advice sometimes. Yeah, sorry to hear that. What inspires or motivates you? I want to provide for my family. I want to be the best dad, the best, the best partner, the best husband I can be. Yeah, I just want to be a good person and provide for my boys. I want to be the best role model for my boys that I can be because it's important. It's pretty chaotic out there and the better people we can have running around to make the world a better place is good. And I want my boys to be those kind of people. On that note, that was an excellent rapid fire. That's all the set of questions I had for you. Thank you so much, Zach, for attending this podcast. I really do appreciate it. No, I appreciate the opportunity and I look forward to working with you in the future, man. Take care. All right. Take care. Absolutely love talking to Zach. Hope you enjoyed the talk as well. Thanks for listening to the show. As always, stay safe and be well.